This is Epicenter, episode 353 with guest Ken Gwen. Hi, I'm Sebastian Couture, and you're listening to Epicenter, the podcast where we interview crypto founders, builders, and thought leaders. On this show, we dive deep to learn how things work at a technical level, and we fly high to understand visionary concepts and long-term trends. If you like Epicenter, the best way to support us is to leave a review on Apple Podcasts. If you're on a Mac or iOS device, the easiest way to do that is to go to epicenter.rocks Apple. We read every single review we receive, and we love getting them. Today, our guest is Ken Gwen. He's the co-founder and CEO of Republic. Republic is an investment platform that allows pretty much anyone, anywhere in the world, of any income or net worth to invest in private equity startups. Crowdfunding has been around for over a decade, and most of you are certainly familiar with Kickstarter and Indiegogo. But since the Jobs Act of 2016, these platforms were able to offer equity to funders, albeit with certain restrictions, which is something that was previously impossible in the U.S. due to accredited investor rules. So Republic launched just after the Jobs Act was passed, And of course, this was around the same time that companies began raising funds with ICOs, and they were among the first platforms to offer a framework for security token offerings. Well, with the ICO boom well behind us, Republic is innovating once again with their Republic Note product. This is a profit-sharing token, which allows investors to receive dividends when companies who raise money on the platform make an exit. The tokens are issued by Republic, actually they're issued by a subsidiary, which distributes a portion of the exit profits to investors in proportion to their holdings. Of course, this is kind of similar to the Binance token model, which isn't surprising since Republic was the first portfolio company of Binance Labs. So what's interesting here is that this is almost as if Republic had gone public, just not on a regulated stock exchange. And so Brian and I spoke with Ken about the long-term regulatory implications for this model and the opportunities that it opens up for startup funding. This was a really fascinating interview. Ken is inspiring, and he shares his vision with a lot of clarity, so I really hope you enjoy this. A little bit of housekeeping before we go to the interview. About two months ago, we launched Epicenter Premium here on the podcast, and sadly, we're going to be ending that today. And I'd like to share a little bit of the trajectory of how this came to be and why we're stopping this experiment. At Epicenter, we've been thinking about doing some form of premium content for over two years. And about a year ago, we did a small experiment with a handful of you know, very close and loyal listeners to see if there was an interest for this. And that experiment didn't go so well. After some time, we realized that the content that we were offering wasn't really that valuable to the people who had signed up for it. So we sat on the idea for a while. And in the wake of the COVID crisis, as you know, a lot of sponsors were backing out or there was reduced interest in terms of sponsorship deals, I felt that it was necessary to revive this idea to try to secure new forms of revenue for the show. And so we launched the premium product once again, but this time with the episode debrief as a sort of flagship thing that premium listeners would receive. And my assumptions about how this would go were totally off. Based on the previous experiment, I had anticipated that we would get at least a few dozen subscribers, which would have given us enough momentum to keep this thing going and to continue growing it. But that was far from being the case. Some of you did subscribe, and I want to thank you for trusting us with this and supporting us. But unfortunately, there just isn't enough momentum around this to keep it going. So the main takeaway here is that monetizing content is really hard. You know, I look up to all these other shows who have built a business around monetizing their content. And it's something that I truly like to emulate. But I think it takes a lot of work and it's something you have to start early. But I'm curious to know what it was about Epicenter Premium that wasn't particularly appealing. So if you have anything to share, you can reach me at Sebastian at Epicenter.tv or on Twitter. So what about the episode debriefs? What will we make of those? Well, we really like doing them to be honest, like it's kind of fun after we've just spent like over an hour with someone to chit chat amongst each other and share our own thoughts about the conversation, about the interview. And so I think we'll continue doing them whenever we feel we have something to share and we'll put them out on the podcast. 
for everyone to hear. And with that, here's our conversation with Ken Gwen. So we're here with Ken Gwen, the founder and CEO of Republic, and really excited to speak with you today, Ken, about Republic and some of the super innovative things you guys are doing with crowdfunding and Republic Note in particular. So thanks so much for joining us. Brian, thank you so much for having me. Wonderful being here. For some people, uh, probably haven't heard about Republic, right? But Republic is sort of connected with AngelList. And AngelList, of course, had a big impact on crowdfunding. I mean, there's also CoinList, right, that has come out of that, that we've had on the podcast before as well. Can you speak a little bit about like your background, your time at AngelList, and sort of how that evolved into starting Republic? I started out my career as a securities attorney uh, in New York, and then over time went into asset management and back into academia. So back in uh, 2013, I got a chance to get introduced to Naval um, and the AngelList team uh, and became their general counsel when they roll out this new investment product called syndication, right, that everyone knows about. But uh, AngelList syndication is only available to millionaires or accredited investors. And then under President Obama, there's a change in U.S. law, and this is very relevant for blockchain later on as well, that the change in the law allow for non-accredited, meaning anyone, doesn't matter what, what income or net worth, to invest in private securities. And that became fully legal in 2016. And that's when I left AngelList to launch Republic, but AngelList ended up invested in us. So they're a significant backer among many other VCs. So that's the, the heritage uh, between our two companies. Cool. And yeah, I think many people have heard of the, you know, the Jobs Act and, and that regulation. So tell us a little bit about like, what was that change that happened in 2016? And you know, what was the opportunity that opened up back then? If I may take a walk down memory lane or history lane and go a little bit far back, you know, there's uh, the Great Depression in the United States back in the 1930s, like 80 years ago. After that, well, regulators in D.C. decided, hey, to avoid investors getting defrauded, no one can invest in private securities in a private company unless they're really rich. And if they're rich, we assume that they're sophisticated and can, you know, tolerate the loss of capital. So that went on for 80 years. And even though in the U.S. people spend like $80 billion a year in lottery ticket and the same amount at the casino, and yet you have to be a millionaire to invest in startup, it obviously stopped making sense a while back. But it took uh, the Obama administration uh, and a change in the law for that to really now open the gateway so that anyone, if they go through a platform like Republic, can invest in early stage Google, early stage Facebook, or you know a restaurant even. And we're a little bit behind compared to our European counterparts, particularly the UK and uh, other countries in the EU uh, that had allowed uh, for democratized private investing years before the US. So what inspired you to start Republic? And was there anything that you saw during your time at AngelList, which kind of convinced you that there was a problem worth solving here? The problem worth solving, uh, I think, goes a little bit back before my time at AngelList. So my family immigrated to the U.S. from Vietnam, and we settled out in Palo Alto in the Bay Area. And just because you are right in the thick of like innovation, and at the time, Amazon and Google were like new startups, and everyone wanted to invest, but like we weren't accredited, so we weren't able to invest. And, you know, even neighbors who were accredited, meaning millionaires, doctors, lawyers, they still couldn't invest either. So kind of like the teenage me was like, man, I wish I get to put a little bit of money uh, into like Amazon or Google early on, but couldn't. And I think that kind of like stayed with me. And, you know, I went on and became a lawyer and worked in Wall Street and still couldn't invest privately. Uh, so that desire to 
make venture capital private investing more accessible i think there's a little bit of a personal background behind that an angel is it's just a model that when i knew about i was like wow these guys are making it possible for my older siblings who are physicians and engineers to invest that's really cool and so that's why i joined angel is back in 2013 that's only a, you know, a glimmer of the possibility, though. What we do at Republic is kind of like the hope that even a single mom in Vietnam or Ecuador one day can invest like $5 in a startup in Silicon Valley. And I think blockchain and ICO fulfill that ambition to some extent. I agree with the fact that kind of like blockchain it goes towards that vision. I remember in the early days of this podcast when we used to kind of you know, think about where tokenization would lead us. One of the things that would often come up is like any hot dog stand could basically tokenize his business. And with platforms like Republic, it sort of seems like that vision is slowly coming in to fruition. So what is your vision for Republic? And you know, what does the future hold in your view in terms of, like you said, like anybody being able to invest $5 into business? The vision, uh, and it's not uh, my vision for Republic, I think that for the private markets overall, I really see entrepreneurship as like a shared economy in this sense, that it doesn't take that many years ago that entrepreneurship only means two things. Either you're someone who's lucky enough to actually found a company and find your way to venture capitalist, or you one of those venture capitalists that can invest. That's the sandbox of entrepreneurship for people, founders with access and venture capitalists. I do think that entrepreneurship got to mean a whole lot more, given that it's going to define how we live and work in the future. That means that everyone has a little bit of a stake in whatever it is that they believe in. It may be a restaurant, it may be a female founder, it may be a technology like blockchain. So the notion of Amazon, but for private investing, meaning millions and millions of people thinking of making small investment in things they believe in as quickly and easily with as many as options as buying products on Amazon. And that's a, a, a shift in spending behavior in financial investment activities. Uh, but we think that within this decade, it will become a mainstream uh, concept. Uh, and I'm hoping that it will become mainstream in a couple of years and not 10 years. How much of an impact do you think U.S. securities regulation has had in delaying that from happening? The U.S. not had accredited investor rules. Do you think that this would have happened a long time ago, or are there other forces at play here, like technology or just sort of general trends? It would be really difficult to predict that had U.S. securities law not have a restriction around accreditation, how things would mature, because that parameter was put in place to protect investors 80 years ago, right? So, but the thing is that with technological changes and social changes, the law changes more slowly. And so it takes a little bit of time for that regulatory framework to catch up. And it is catching up. I think now the means for mass adoption of private investing is here. It's just a little clumsy and it's going to get refined over time. But I do think very much that based on what we have currently, and we have a very good public-private dialogue with state and federal government, I'm very confident that I don't see any major barrier that prevents adoption. The number one barrier that prevents adoption is that people's attention span nowadays about nine seconds. So it's really hard to get through the concept of anything complex like private investing when people don't have that attention span. So inadvertently, COVID and the pandemic has been very helpful because people <laughs> have a lot more time right at home to watch webinar. Um, so uh, yeah, there's been a silver lining in terms of getting the message out. Thanks so much for explaining that. And that's a really cool and clear vision you have. You talked about like crypto also being one of the things that sort of enables that. 
What sort of your interaction been from the Republic side with crypto? I mean, initially it was started as like, you know, not a crypto company, right? And the, the Jobs Act is like unrelated to crypto. And then I think over time you've done more and more things with crypto. How have you sort of looked at crypto? Blockchain is a technology, uh, it's many use cases uh, and how I think it will become, it will prove to be uh, the most important technology of our lifetime. I think that uh, many people have written dissertations and, and expounded on it. The two attributes about blockchain as a technology that's very relevant to what we do. But beyond that, I think it will change financial services and investment products as we know of it. The two attributes, one is automation, the other one is factionalization. The ability to break any asset class or any share down to smaller and smaller pieces and enabling people to transfer them and confirm settlement payment so seamlessly and at low cost, it naturally lends itself to a lot more people being able to get into the sandbox by virtue of being able to invest small amount of money. So from real estate to art to private investing, I think this technology will underline all aspect of capital raising and investing in the future in a way that people probably wouldn't even need to know what it is, you know, in the way that you and I are using email now. But I can't tell you exactly how emailing actually works. It just does. And I think down the road, hopefully in a few years, that founders, even for a food truck, would be raising on a blockchain leveraged basis, and they do not need to know what tokenization means. You started doing Republic Crypto as well. Like, what was Republic Crypto? How did you sort of like move on from there in your thinking? You know, for crowdfunding or crowd investing, as I call it, uh, when we started out in 2016, it was uh, the vision is to be Amazon for private investing. But at the beginning, it was really hard. These campaigns only raised like $50,000, $100,000. And then out of nowhere, this ICO boom, initial coin offering in 2016, 2017, in many ways, those were like the validation case of what crowdfunding could be. You have new projects raising $50 million, $20 million from individuals around the world on this notion of selling a coin. But that was basically crowdfunding, except that it was done in a non-compliant manner. These tokens generally under U.S. law are all deemed to be securities, but these ICOs didn't comply in any way with U.S. securities law, and that's why they were able to raise so much globally. So we saw that and we're like, hey, this is a validation for what crowd investing can be. But it's very clear that the blockchain industry needs a regulatory framework a compliant way to do these things. And so we roll out and we were very uh, instrumental in the first few compliant ICOs in the United States, uh, Filecoin, Blockstack, etc. But when you apply securities parameters to ICOs, then naturally you saw the industry slowing down a little bit. It became more difficult for founders to go through all of these steps. Uh, but in short, Republic, uh, since 2017, 2018, have been using the same legal framework that we had for traditional offering of private securities and apply it to digital securities. So essentially make the whole notion of token offering more compliant and more accessible. So that's our edge in the space, which is a legal tool to help token projects be able to reach their community in a way that, you know, makes sense uh, from the regulatory standpoint. So I'm curious about Republic's customer base or you know, investor base. And also on the other side, the startups that choose to raise on Republic. Can you talk a bit a little bit th about those two categories of people and what they have in common? So, you know, from the startup side, like what are the typical kinds of startups that you see raising on, on Republic and who are the people who choose to invest in them? And allow me to uh, just define what Republic does for the audience, perhaps. And in short, we're an investment platform that allows anyone pretty much anywhere in the world of any income and net worth to invest 
in some of the best uh, startups and private equities that we curate. Now, uh, what is the difference between or the advantage of crowd investing uh, compared to traditional capital? There's a saying in Silicon Valley that capital is cheap and that with money, usually founders also look at the value add, what comes with that money. In the case of a VC like Sequoia Capital and Dreesen Horowitz, it comes with advice and network of like, you know, be able to introduce you to the soft bank of the world. When it comes to crowd investing, the unique value proposition here is that when one of your customer invest even just $10 into your company, She's going to become a brand ambassador because it's so, you know, if you are a hundred dollar investor in Sky Vodka, that's what you're going to be ordering for your friends when you're out at a bar. That's what you're going to buy for New Year's. And you're going to tell everyone that, hey, I'm an investor in this vodka brand. That notion, that psychological attachment applies across the board, particularly when these are some of the very first private investment that any person has ever made given that this is so new. So that marketing and community engagement element is why crowd investing, crowdfunding is truly suitable for any consumer facing enterprise, tech or non-tech, all the way up until pre-IPO. To give you an example, Airbnb back right now, Airbnb's pre-IPO and back about a year and a half ago, they even asked the SEC for permission to give out a little bit of equity to those who list their properties on Airbnb so that people feel more engaged, they're going to list a little bit more, they're going to tell the neighbors to do so. The SEC said, hey, no, we're not going to give you any special exemption. You got to use the current law. And Republic now, we have a tool to enable them to do just that. But it comes to demonstrate the value of ownership and community ownership. Uh, so to answer your question, pretty much a company from pre-seed all the way to pre-IPO, as long as they have a community or have an interest in incentivizing a community, crowd investing and at one point tokenization is, in my opinion, the most valuable marketing tool that they can do. Community is a key factor here. So for example, like if you're a SaaS startup building B2B tools, the community aspect there perhaps isn't so present. Whereas let's say like a video game, you have a platform you know, specific for, for video games where there's like a pretty big community aspect there. Is one more suited than the other for a public, would you say? Certainly, if you're fundraising from the crowd and from retail people, uh, the more relatable uh, the business model or product, uh, the more likely the people are going to understand and invest. Uh, that said, though, a good 30% or more of the companies that successfully raised on Republic are B2B or you know, have an enterprise as customer model rather than a consumer facing because there are investors that are just looking at it straight up from an investment perspective. Like, is this company something that I think is going to make me a lot of money because I believe in the technology, even if they themselves are not users or potential users of that product or technology. But by and large, yes, consumer facing businesses are most suitable for crowd investing. Let's talk a little bit about uh, Republic Note. Tell us, what is Republic Note? Republic Note token is uh, the very first of its kind. It's a digital token that pays out profit. So out of every single company that fundraised on Republic, we have a little bit of an upside interest in that company. When that company exits, meaning getting bought out or you know goes public at a profit, that upside potential is realized in cash. A portion of that cash will be paid back out to the note holders. In essence, as Republic continues to grow and accumulate a larger and larger pool of upside interest in all of these portfolio companies, the note holders naturally share in our growth and success. And whenever a company exits, they're going to see something back. So we call it either a profit sharing token 
or another version of that is a revenue a sharing token. But that notion of tokenizing ownership or tokenizing economic interest, I think we're the first, but definitely will not be the last. And we hope to see a lot more of these launching in the next year or two. I was reading through this and, you know, it's, it's a very cool model. One question that kind of came up is, is Republic Node basically something where you say like all of the economic or the vast majority of the economic upside is sort of, you know, like captured in Republic Node or versus, you know, saying like there is kind of like this independent business, you know, and it has equity and value in that. And then somebody goes to the note holder. And so you might have this kind of like tension between those two sides as well. The white paper describes in four because it is a rather complex model. Uh, but to give you an example, all of the companies that crowdfund or crowdfunded past, present and future on Republic, that is republic.co.co, 100% of the upside potential that we have in those companies will eventually go back to the note holders. We do receive cash revenue from different sources, and that's how we run our business. But the retail, the Amazon for private investing model, uh, those companies and the future revenue of that will go to the note holders. So it really is a way for a person, by virtue of holding a single note, have a, an exposure to an evergreen pool of innovations and startups that go through the Republic ecosystem since 2016. So basically the model, right, is like as a company, I want to go on Republic and I'm going to raise, you know, a million dollars and I'm going to sell 10% of my company that then there's some equity that goes to you and some of the cash also goes to you. And with the cash, you kind of, you know, like funding your business and all. And then all of that equity, you know, from all of the companies that have gone through it and all of the future companies that all kind of goes in the pool whenever there's an exit, right? Then from that exit, uh, at once some threshold is reached, that's then kind of dispersed as a dividend to all of the holders of the note. Exactly. And we do anticipate that a good percentage of these companies will not pan out, right? That's the nature of private investing, is that any single early stage company, the likelihood of them just not working out is exceedingly high. But here's a number game. So to give a very concrete example there, Brian, assuming that a company just closed a million dollars on Republic, out of that, we hold a $20,000 worth of equity in that company. Say that company is currently value at $10 million, which is a typical, you know, very early stage valuation for a tech company in Silicon Valley. Say five years down the road, they exit, they get bought out by Uber at $10 billion in valuation. That $20,000 will see a 1,000X markup. And that amount of money just from one single company can be a very meaningful distribution out to note holders. Now, it's impossible for me to say which company in the portfolio has that potential. But here, currently, we have 200 plus companies uh, that we have helped fundraise. And hopefully by this time next year, that number will be 500 or more. And so the longer someone holds on to the note token, the more likely that future dividend payment back to the note holders will at one point should exceed uh, whatever it is that she or he spend to acquire that token. Just to understand the, the mechanics of the token sale here, can you understand how that went through? And also the money that was raised in the token sale, is that the money that you're then using to invest in those companies and that be the equity to redistribute to the token holders if there's an upside? Sebastian, let me answer the second question first. Uh, no, the money uh, that we raised from our token sale goes to our operating and technical and, and operational infrastructure. Uh, the amount being invested basically comes from our growing community. And so Republic today has over nearly 800,000 users out of that a percentage of uh, active investors. The raise is simply for, um, you know, development and maintenance of the note token. We, the concept of this profit sharing token was, you know, came up in early 2018 and Binance, along with a number of other VCs, backed 
this concept, this development. In fact, we're one of the very first, if not the very first portfolio company of Binance the exchange. So we fundraise privately in that round. Then earlier this year, we raised another round privately from strategic investors, less than 10 VCs. And then most recently, about a month ago, we did a public offering. That is, we took in money or investment from accredited investor under something known as Regulation D. We also took in reservations and indications of interest from non-accredited investor and hold the allocation for them as we go through a regulatory process so that to make it possible, hopefully in a couple of months, to confirm and finalize the non-accredited investment as well. So the unique thing about the Republic Note token is that it will be fully accessible and held by accredited and non-accredited community members and new investors around the world. Up until now, as far as I know, all of the so-called digital securities or you know revenue uh, sharing securities have been sold or made available to millionaires only. And obviously you can't really get mass adoption if that's the case. Many people will not be that familiar with, especially the next step, Reg A. I think Reg D, most people are familiar with. I think for Reg A, we, we've done a podcast with Gabe Shapiro as well, where we talked about it. But do you mind talking a little bit about like, what does it look like when you've gone through Reg A? And you know, in what way is it different from, let's say a public equity of something like Apple today? That's a great question, uh, Brian. And uh, if I may answer this question, obviously in the context of US law uh, and regulations, I mentioned uh, a little bit ago that uh, in order, it used to be that in order for non-accredited, non-millionaires to invest uh, in a stock, that company used to have to be a public company going IPO. But ever since in the past few years, this other framework regulatory frameworks that make that possible. So let me use just an analogy real quick. Let's say if going public, uh, the cost of that is like buying a Ferrari. Once you go public, anyone can buy or trade similar to Apple or Google. A Reg D, which is only available to millionaires and, and uh, institutional investors, is very easy to do. It's very quick and easy. Almost anyone can do it within a week uh, from the regulatory standpoint. It's like a bicycle. Quick and fast, but, you know, very limited. Reg CF, crowdfunding, which is what we do uh, at Republic.co primarily, that anyone can spend about $5,000 in three weeks to launch a Rex CF campaign. But currently, you can only raise up to a million dollars max from non-accredited investors. But it's, you know, low cost and relatively quick. There's only one t other tier in between Rex CF and going IPO, and that's Reg A. And that's like buying a Honda Civic or like a Toyota in that it takes about at least three to six months and about two, three hundred thousand dollars or more in order to launch a reggae campaign. If you successfully get your application qualified by the SEC, then you can raise up to 50 million, five zeros from accredited and non-accredited. So the threshold is a lot higher. It's just more expensive and takes longer to go through that process. And the IPO process costs about two or three millions, up to $15 million to do an IPO. And then after that, it takes about a few million dollars a year to maintain. So obviously it's only suitable for like the biggest of corporations and there's no cap. Those are like the four tiers basically. Cool. That was, that was super clear explanation. Thanks. But in terms of this, this thing you receive, right, when you have done the Reg A, like, how does it behave differently in practice? You know, how is the, the Republic Note token, for example, going to be different from, you know, if Apple went to, to tokenize their shares? Yes, uh, the, the question uh, is the dis about the distinction between Reg A securities and like a public securities. Well, the two main, it's not so much distinction, but you should look at uh, private securities or public securities, token or non-token, in the context of 
trading restrictions? What parameters, uh, regulatory parameters that limit people's ability to buy and trade? Because if you can't really trade, then, you know, it loses that, that liquidity, that, that appeal, right? So Reg A securities is interesting in that the moment that is qualified, then it's immediately tradable, similar to an Apple stock or a Google share. The question is, where can it be traded? So when a company like Apple or Google go public, they naturally get listed also on an exchange. And so people will know exactly where to go to buy and sell. With Reg A, whether it's a token or a non-token, you, a company like Republic, would make that initial offering. And then we have to separately figure out secondary solutions for that. Uh, and so it's not as clean uh, or not as so immediately, you know, self-explanatory like buying an Apple stock and knowing for sure that there will be a secondary market. When you buy a Reg A token or Reg A security, you do have to question where is this stock going to be traded? Right. I mean, I think that ties into, of course, uh, you know, great topic, which is the topic of security tokens. and. One of the issues that security tokens so far seem to have had is exactly that, right? That there's like a lack of liquidity and, you know, basically, I think the few companies that have sort of tried that, you know, it it's not had nearly the scale and success as, as the kind of ICO token. So how do you think that's going to play out with like liquidity and security tokens? And like, what's your sort of take in general on where we are with security tokens? Uh, and Brian, Sebastian, I think you both would agree that uh, STO uh, has been underperforming compared to like the hype that it was getting a year or two ago. And there's a reason why there's been this um, slow maturation of security tokens overall, uh, twofold. One is that people haven't found a way until very recently to make it accessible to non-millionaires. So you can't really have active trading if it's just 500 high net worth individuals owning a bunch of tokens. You know, you can't really have an active market in that way. Uh, and now there is that legal framework. Uh, Republic is one, uh, but you know, before that block stack and props already use Reg A to, to make their tokens available to, to the masses. The second, at the reason behind that, uh, is due to the fact that there hasn't been a credible enough, and by credible enough, I mean a large, an enterprise or a business or a project with large enough of a user base. So the best that I have seen of securities token before 2020 were like tokenized real estate projects, but it's like a class B real estate project some, in some random state. And again, only held by a few hundred millionaires. So, of course, without a community, without, you know, hundreds of thousands of millions of participants in the ecosystem and without credible tokens, you couldn't have that adoption. Uh, a little bit self-serving on our end, but, you know, we have a very large user base. 800,000 is probably larger than most exchanges. And we've been around for four years with a business model that I think people understand. So we hope that the Republic Note token over the next six months will move the needle forward when it comes to STO adoption. But are there currently exchanges, like for example, where, where you can actually trade, let's say the, the block stack token or like when reggae happens, for Republic Note in the fall, where are we going to be able to trade the token? Yeah, so legally uh, here in the US, uh, there are already a few exchanges that have allegedly have the licenses to, to list and trade. Um, and there are a few names, you know, Open Finance, uh, I think Shares Post, and a few more. Now, they haven't had too many credible tokens or projects to trade. But we are working in dialogues with a number of them, and we do fully expect for the Republic Note token to be um, to have secondary uh, liquidity by the end of the year. 
One of the questions we had was with regards to the payouts. And so the no token has a dividends p- feature, which you've explained earlier, where if there's an exit, uh, then the no, no token holders would receive a dividend. How does that work? In what form do they receive dividends? Is it cash or is it some kind of stable coin or how does that work? Uh, yes, the, the no token will be, uh, you know, launching on the Algorand protocol. Uh, and when it comes to digital tokens, there are a couple attributes that make it very different than so-called utility token in that, uh, among other things, you got to control, know your customer, anti-money laundering, you know, accreditation verification. But also, if you're going to pay out profits or economic interest or dividends, you got to be able to issue this payment through stable coin, right? So there are a few uh, chains that enable that. Uh, Stellar, EOS, Ethereum, and of course, Algorand. Uh, so Algorand uh, is also a backer of the Republic Note token. Um, but we, of course, will be uh, planned to, to make uh, the dividend payment through, you know, USD, uh, Tether, uh, stable coin back to the underlying note holders. Okay, so this requires that Algorand has some sort of stablecoin launched on its platform. Yes. Okay, so it's it's sort of dependent on that happening, or yeah, they they already have. Uh, I mean, there are more than one options on the Algorand protocol currently, uh, and uh, I think Binance we will be issuing a wrapped token on Binance Chain, which currently doesn't accommodate securities token just yet, but will be at least we hope that they will be very soon. Cool. Uh, which brings up the question uh, about Algorand. So we recently had Algorand, uh, the Algorand team on the show. And so I'm curious why you chose to build on Algorand and in what ways is it differentiated from building on Ethereum? I'm such a big fan of the Algorand team uh, for a number of reasons. I mean, technically, the, the, the founding team, the technical founders of Algorand is, needless to say, like MIT professors, some of like the most respected names uh, in, in tech, in the industry. But in short, compared to the alternatives, in our subjective assessment, it is stronger, faster, and definitely cheaper. So just those three elements alone would make Algorand a preferred protocol for us. But they also invested in Republic and the Republic token. So that alignment of interest, you know, really made it uh, even easier uh, for us to to strike uh, that partnership. I mean, Algorand is a, a, a new platform, sort of re- relative to Ethereum. What was it like building the Node token on Algorand? And can you talk a little bit about? I know that Algorand is sort of targeting, you know, the security token market. Uh, can you talk about some of the benefits of using Algorand from this perspective? Uh, not only that, Algorand is focusing on the security token market. They have like a specific commitment, dedication to servicing financial product and uh, investment uh, sector. So out of that, um, is you know, even though they're new, they're very focused. And on the business side, they have in for for the past you know year or two built relationship with traditional financial um, you know institutions in the U.S. and outside. So that focus uh, and that enabled them to do a number of things from both the security standpoint, the pricing standpoint, the speed of things that makes someone that make them highly attractive to someone like us, which operates entirely in the investment industry and aim to disrupt that space. Out of that focus, I think their ability to invest in building the ecosystem and supporting their projects naturally is going to be a bit more helpful to people like Republic compared to something like Ethereum, which is you know far wider in its intention and in its roadmap. Uh, so in our case, the, the, the novelty of it uh, is an easy trade-off for, for the, the focus uh, that, that the Algorand team um, you know, had in, in mapping out uh, their, their project. Yeah, really cool. I'm curious, you mentioned KYC and anti-money laundering before. And of, of course, like one of the kind of question that comes up for me here is, so you have this Republic node token you know, to what extent will it be possible to, you know, like integrate it into like DeFi and different types of applications? I know there are some people who've done security tokens in Europe 
And there, it seems to have been the tendency that, you know, they'd have to do KYC uh, when selling the token, but afterwards it's kind of, there's no KYC needed. And I think even that dividends could be paid out to like, you know, whoever holds the token at that point. What kind of ongoing restrictions will there be on the tokens? The DeFi world is definitely operating in this gray area uh, of the law. It doesn't matter which jurisdiction it's in, whether it's with respect to U.S. laws or German laws or U.K. law. The Republic Note token is definitely not fully decentralized uh, in that we plan out of necessity to be not in a gray area, but so clearly complying with U.S. securities law first and foremost. So that requires us to take responsibility for making sure that know your customer anti-money laundering accreditation jurisdictional barriers are like fully compliant with so there is a heavy degree of centralization or like central monitoring and so the network uh, you know the different protocols that allows for white listing features that from our perspective as the issuer, the entity that offers token, have the ability to maintain a whitelist to vet and to clear people, not just during the primary offering, but thereafter when two parties are buying or trading, selling tokens, that they have to clear through KYC and AML on our end. And not only that, we have the ability to freeze and burn tokens as well in so far that a transaction turns out to not meet uh, the relevant country's KYC AML standard. So we currently operate not in the same grave framework as many other DeFi projects, uh, but we obviously are keeping a close lens and we intend to collaborate later on where relevant. Uh, but I think for, for DeFi trading, at one point, there gotta be a clearer regulatory landscape because right now I can't say as a securities lawyer that transaction being done, uh, you know, the DeFi transactions are truly compliant just because there hasn't been a slapdown or smackdown by the SEC or various entity. It doesn't mean that there won't be. Uh, so we're very cautious about the, the whole concept of truly decentralized finance for now. Probably good to be cautious in this. <laughs> In this regard, um, I want to come back to DeFi in a little bit, but first I wanted to come back to a question that I, I wanted to ask earlier, which is about um, we we kind of touched on this a little bit, but um, Republic is currently addressing, I believe, only the U.S. market. In fact, to be an investor, I think for certain types of um, products that you offer, you also have to be a U.S. citizen. What is your view on the EU market, and do you plan to start addressing well startups in the EU and also EU investors? As our listeners will will know, you know, EU securities regulations are often seen as somewhat simpler and they're open to non-accredited investors. So there seems to be less red tape uh, in the EU market. What's your general thoughts on that? As a uh, crypto enthusiast, but even before that, I'm a firm believer in a more global uh, economy. Uh, and uh, the whole promise of blockchain is to make the jurisdictional boundaries, you know, blurrier over time and then at one point removing them together. So whatever we do or have been doing at Republic, there's always a long-term global ambition. Uh, so today, even though we only actively operate in the U.S., any investor outside of the U.S. that passively come to us to make an investment, generally we're open to them. But we at the same time have been working with partners in different continents and countries to make sure that down the road and not too far out, maybe even in early 2020, that we can legally work with, um, you know, different uh, jurisdictions. Uh, I'm going to pick uh, the EU as an example. Back when the UK was still part of the EU, we struck a partnership with a platform comparable to Republic, but more established, they've been around for longer, uh, in the United Kingdom. And uh, that does allow for non-accredited investors to invest in private securities. Uh, obviously, with a Brexit, uh, we now are eyeing 
other partners in perhaps uh, Germany or France. Uh, to make that possible, we have an informal partnership with a platform in Australia uh, and are looking very actively at the Middle East uh, as well as Asia. Uh, but surely it's clumsy. Uh, it, the good thing is that the U.S. security's legal framework is so strict that if you comply in the U.S. with U.S. laws, You're like 90% in terms of like compliance. In most other countries, you just need to find the right partners, go through the right regulatory approval process. But the framework of KYC, of AML, of accreditation, of sophistication, you know, similar enough. Um, so it's just a matter of time, uh, Sebastian, when we, when we make this much more actively possible globally. I'm personally looking forward to it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. You mentioned Binance before, and of course, the interesting thing about Binance was that, you know, we had people doing all these ICOs and then Binance came and they basically did, you know, an ICO, but for a private, a centralized company, of course, you know, over time, Binance became a bit more like, you know, decentralized and now, you know, it's, it's a sort of hybrid thing. But what, you know, what we saw in Binance was this just insane amount of growth And, you know, still, I think one of my favorite episodes we've did on here was with CZ talking about like exactly that. Uh, and, the, you know, the Binance token played such a big, a big role in this. And now I think you're, you're basically doing something like quite similar. So I'm wondering like to what extent you see like Binance as like an inspiration, like what, what are the biggest learnings for you from Binance and, you know, what are some ways that maybe you're going to go a different path? Uh, I personally feel incredibly fortunate that we get to be part of like a couple uh, powerful ecosystem, Angelus uh, being one. That's, uh, you know, when we started out um, uh, with, with the investment and when we got that backing from Binance, uh, Binance Labs and then became a member of the Binance ecosystem, uh, that's just another, you know, stroke of luck that not only gave us the capital, but really just the inspiration uh, to, to uh, you know, to enter the space and to build and to do what we do. Uh, but to answer your question, Brian, I have no doubt that not just Binance, but other major uh, players in the space are taking the notion of tokenized equities or securities token with renewed interest. And given that in the U.S. Republic is probably a leading, if not the leading brand uh, in, in the tokenization and STO space uh, that, you know, we have been consulting with the Binance team on the roadmap for 2020 Uh, and how hopefully together we can be, you know, we can collaborate more meaningfully. I probably have a lot more details to share uh, in the coming months on what that conversation or collaboration may look like. But I think uh, it should bode well for STO as an industry overall, uh, because right now there still hasn't been a major brand, a major player like the Binance of the world making a statement saying that now is the time that we see the writing on the wall and that we're willing to invest and go in and build this. And hopefully we'll see that soon. So when you have SEOs, you know, let's say now with Republic, you'll have maybe after the Reg A, you'll have some, you know, tens of thousands, hopefully of, you know, sort of like of owners of this business in a way. How do you think that will change how people, you know, build companies and run companies? The uh, framework for tokenization will raise a number of issues that only over time uh, can be fully square out. To give you an example, you raise an amazing point in that how would a founder having tokenized equity and ownership and now have 50,000 investors I mean, imagine the, if you just deal with 50 investors and the hassle that comes with that, how do you deal with 50,000 investors? What's the standard practice, the expectation, communication channel 
forget about cap table and all of that. If something, if there's like something bad in the news, how do you make sure that people just don't lash out and like go crazy on Telegram and Twitter? So all of these things are what we are validating and testing at Republic. And we hope to deliver options for people who come after us and look at us and our learning and use it. So you asked earlier, Brian, what will we use the proceeds from our own token sale for? It's about portfolio management, about investor control. It's about laying out all the compliance as well as just, you know, accounting best practice for this. Uh, I have a little bit of a background in corporate governance. Um, I was a, a fellow at uh, the Center for Corporate Governance at Stanford University about you know, almost 10 years ago. And that, the issues that apply to a public company, oddly enough, at a smaller scale, is very much relevant here. Uh, it's just how to make it feasible. Because if you make it too complex, then it kind of like defeat the whole point of tokenizing, uh, you know, simply and cheaply, right? So there's a, there's a balance somewhere that we're still working on. So before we wrap up, we wanted to talk a little bit about accredited investor status in the U.S. And I think it was Jim Bianco who came on the podcast recently who who talked about the need for accredited investor status to change in order to kind of stimulate the economy in the in the wake of of COVID. You you mentioned earlier that the this regulation is over eighty years old. It is changing now with this these different Reg A, Reg B, etc. regimes. What other changes do you think can and should happen, which would be, you know, a welcome uh, change to the uh, credit investor rules in the U.S.? You know, having spent a little bit of time in Europe and uh, study law in uh, in England, uh, I think there's a common um, generalization that Americans are less nuanced uh, than our European counterparts. And it definitely is true when it comes to the notion of accreditation. We are the only country, as far as I know, developed uh, of, of the you know developed uh, countries that defines accreditation straight up based on wealth in every single country in Europe. Uh, there's a sophistication, you know, definition as well. So here's an example under U.S. law. The law actually assumes that if you're an MBA grad from Harvard uh, and an analyst at Goldman Sachs, since you just graduated with debt, you're not accredited, but that that person is less suitable to make investment decisions than someone who's 85 and has been a history teacher and just save over her life to just exceed that, that threshold, that person under U.S. law is suitable to make highly risky investments compared to a Goldman analyst. That clearly is not the case. So I think there are uh, learnings that U.S. legal system can, you know, can, can, can borrow from, um, you know, other uh, countries like Germany and, and the U.K. That said, though, I think the current legal framework in the U.S. that enables non-accredited investors to participate under Reg CF and Reg A are adequate. Can things be better? Yes, but there's no question that now in 2020, pretty much everyone has the ability to participate in private investing. The issue is less regulatory and just awareness. And Sebastian, if I may share like a fun fact this is a study from a major consulting firm in the U.S. that in 10 years, Fortune 500 companies in the year 2030, 75% of them have yet to exist today. So if you consider the fact that the vast majority of the companies that will dictate how one lives and works in the future are like in someone's head or someone's garage today. It definitely begs the question that why wouldn't you, if you can, even if you're a student for a price of a pitcher of beer, not take an interest and have a stick, however small it may be, in whatever products or investment or storylines or founders that you believe is worth backing. It's kind of like voting. Are you just going to leave it to the big banks and the financial uh, capitalists? To, to dictate your future, or would you cast your vote in this case with a little bit of capital? And so that notion of private investing, the ability to vote with your money, 
I think it's still unknown to 99% of the world, accredited and non-accredited. So the biggest challenge and also the biggest potential is in exposure and, and getting the message out, which is why I'm so grateful for to be on, on programs, uh, you know, like this to, to that you guys have me on, uh, more so than any tweaks that would come out of Washington, D.C. Or, or other federal agencies. Yeah, no, I mean, thanks so much for, for this note and these comments. And I think it's really amazing what you're working on. And I'm so excited to see, you know, to see this kind of like developing, see your public note publicly traded and all of that process to happen. But I, I mean, I fully agree with you. I think this idea that like democratizing access to this to like everyone in the world is, a, is a amazing and super excited that you're working on this. Thank you so much, Brian. Thanks, Sebastian, for, for having me and for having our story. Thank you. So we just wrapped up our interview with Ken Guen of Republic. And it was like, I thought it was a really kind of inspiring story and kind of a, a really interesting story about like how he started Republic and his whole vision for you know how startup funding should you know, move into this more like community um, community-based model. Uh, I'm curious what you thought of the interview. Yeah, I mean, I think they're doing really cool work. You know, at one point we were at, at Course One, we were also kind of like looking a little bit into thinking, oh, could we issue some token? And actually at the time we were like looking at it from a legal perspective too, and I came across Republic Note. This was like a year ago and I was like, wow, this is a very, um, yeah, it's a very innovative and cool way of approaching it. And it's great that now, like they've advanced so much, and it's it's out. So, yeah, I'm I'm very excited about it, and I think his vision of like actually making this something that you know is accessible to anyone in the world, and you can invest as little as you know five dollars. So, yeah, it's very inspiring, and I'm um, I'm certainly very impressed with Republic. Yeah, it's it's interesting how you know in in the early days of you know, ethereum and even before ethereum when you know when we're talking about primarily about bitcoin how you know this idea of you know, tokenizing any business or allowing anyone to invest in any business you know was kind of going around in the counterparty days if you'll remember uh, and and this is kind of that coming to fruition but it's you know i don't i don't think that back then we envisioned that some kind of a centralized platform would be the issuer of these tokens we, we kind of thought it would be more like on a decentralized flavor at least for me and you know it's kind of interesting that in the end well yeah since companies have to build this infrastructure and you know it's not necessarily some dap you know or some like dao that's uh, kind of leading the way on this on this um, new model yeah i mean i think the the regulatory issues are obviously there and so from that perspective, it, you know, it kind of makes sense that, you know, that you have to do it maybe to a centralized platform with KYC and all of that. Uh, of course, at the same time, and we didn't speak about that in the interview, we do have a lot of uh, similar things happening uh, in the decentralized space, right? Where you have, you know, all these, like, let's say Ethereum DeFi protocols, there's like tokenizing and, you know, people can earn tokens. Um, and of course you still have token sales of like various types type happening, or maybe people like privately raise and then list the pro projects on exchanges and, you know, people buy it. So I think there's still like many, many ways that projects are fundraising that, you know, maybe don't take this like direct security, uh, token path. And I, I don't think they're going to succeed in shutting those down. Uh, and of course, you know, the Binance, which uh, is being the best example of that, right? Binance, uh, that it has been some of the inspiration, uh, perhaps for Republic. But at the same time, I think it's it's really great that there is this, you know, like kind of clear, compliant path as well. And it seems like that path is becoming, you know, more viable and more accessible option. Mm. It's also interesting if you, if you just look at uh, the complexity you know, I mean, he did a great job of, of explaining the different, you know, regulatory regimes in the U.S., but the, the level of complexity in, in U.S. securities regulation in order to do what, you know, here in Europe is fairly easy, I would say. Like, if one wants to launch a security token, like, depending on your jurisdiction, like, it's... I mean, I, I don't know if this is quite true. Like, you know, I mean, of course, complex issue, right? But, like, in in Germany, for example... 
there is an active crowdfunding scene, but I think it's all debt based. So to have like equity crowdfunding is something that I think doesn't really exist in Germany. So I think here as well, you know, there are some uh, regulatory complexities that that have kind of like made that impossible or impossible, or at least uh, so hard that it hasn't been done yet. So I think those issues probably exist too in other places. Although I guess the UK that he mentioned is certainly one thing where you've seen, you know, equity crowdfunding for many years now. Yeah, I mean, it, the, it, it also exists here in France. And I mean, if, for one to do a security token sale here in France, it's, yeah, I'd say, like relatively easy. There may be some sort of legal costs associated to it, and you do have to do a perspective and this sort of thing. But from an investor point of view, you know, the rules are much, much easier, like across Europe. And, you know, I, I'd be curious to see, like, what, what they're going to do here and like how they'll deploy and the, you know, the types of products that they're going to be able to um, propose here uh, in Europe uh, as opposed to in the U.S. and if this will be different. I don't think they even need uh, particular products, right? I mean, they is mentioned, right? Like this is this is available at na- right now, Republic for non-Americans as well. Um, I mean, maybe they will need different offerings for, i guess they will need different offerings for the company side right to like cater to european startups but i think european investors or like non-american investors you know they'll, they'll be able to use republic as well i mean i think you have in any ways you have this kind of unusual thing that you know the us is willing to like go after platforms outside of the us that they think violate us securities law but you know, other countries don't tend to do that so much yeah, the distribution model. And when we were talking about this before the show, you you mentioned something that we didn't really talk about on the show, which was that essentially by doing this note token, Republic kind of went public. And I wanted you to elaborate a little bit on that. And from a sort of functional perspective, they did go public, but like from a sort of regulatory perspective, they didn't. But like, what what do you think that entails like for the way that startups you know, might try to raise funding in the future? Yeah, I mean, first of all, I guess the, the the public thing is going to be more in the fall with the Reg A, right, where it's really accessible to anyone. I, I guess, you know, it's cool that that's an option, although, you know, the caveat is still what what he mentioned, right, that there is, uh, I think at the moment he said two to $300,000 in, like, legal costs, and, you know, you still have this public reporting requirement. So there's still, you know, significant overhead maybe around this Reg A offering, but you know, that's probably still a viable option for, you know, maybe startups that are like a little bit later stage, you know, like a series B, series C, uh, series D. So I think if those become more like public accessible by, you know, everyone, I think that's really amazing. And, and he's right what he's pointed out there. I think like having this ownership in, you know, the products you use and companies you hear about, like that's, that's something powerful that like builds communities. And I think Binance with Binance coin is like the best example of that. So I think if that's accessible to like many more companies and yeah, maybe the, right, the grocery store too, and the restaurant and the bar, and that would be really cool. I mean, I would love to buy like some equity in like various, you know, businesses that actually use or around here. I mean, just you know, think about it, like imagine a world where this exists for uber for example and so you just like open up your uber app and they're like hey do you want to invest in our next funding round you can do it with your credit card and it takes you know a few minutes and there might be some kyc or there might be some kind of onboarding process but like you know you can do it in the time that it takes you to get to your destination kind of thing like i think that would be immensely valuable to the companies but also like to the people investing in it. and it just the the reach that you know i think like for for a company that's in a sort of series maybe series b c d phase where they already have you know potentially tens of thousands of users and already have that reach even things like social networks like a snapchat or where the, the reach is even bigger like the potential here to create like this new type of public company with like secondary markets that isn't like you know the ipo at the ipo level i think it's like immensely fascinating yeah cool well thanks thanks for doing this thank you for joining us on this week's episode we release new episodes every week you can find and subscribe to the show on itunes spotify youtube soundcloud or wherever you listen to podcasts and if you have a google home or alexa device 
you can tell it to listen to the latest episode of the Epicenter podcast. Go to epicenter.tv slash subscribe for a full list of places where you can watch and listen. And while you're there, be sure to sign up for the newsletter so you get new episodes in your inbox as they're released. If you want to interact with us, the guests, or other podcast listeners, you can follow us on Twitter. And please leave us a review on iTunes. It helps people find the show, and we're always happy to read them. So thanks so much, and we look forward to being back next week.